بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين على مر الدنيا والدين وصلى الله على سيدنا مرسلين الخاتم النبيين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, I want to thank you all for having me here uh, the organizers of the university the ISAC group uh, and the sponsors, Human Relief Fund, uh, Human Relief Foundation. I really do appreciate them as well as Like Media and uh, sponsoring me to come here today to speak to you briefly uh, about this issue of transformation slash hypocrisy. And I know that uh, the, the theme through most of the Like Media tours have been uh, we've been utilizing movie titles. And I know that the one when we talked about transformation was obviously Transformers, right? And, and I'm sure most of you, at least I like to think that most of you, when you watch films like this, or any movie for that matter, that you do kind of look at the film from the point of view of Islam. Or what can you get out of the film so it's just not just rude entertainment, just being mesmerized by the, uh, the, the cinematography and the action and all these different things. You know, obviously for those people who are in film, your eye is a little bit different. But then as Muslims, our eye should be different as we approach the you know, viewing uh, films such as these or any film for that matter. I don't care if it's romance or action or thrillers, whatever the case may be. So with that being said, when we're talking about, when we look at this film Transformers, and, and really, you know, I grew up watching the cartoons of the Transformers. It's not the cartoons that you grew up with. The artwork wasn't as nice. The ones I had, you know, they were a little more curved. They weren't as blocked out, weren't as detailed. But the premise is still the same. We've got a group of robots right, machines, that through their battles and their wars and their bickering and their lack of ability to understand how to work cohesively, because one group wanting peace and just everyone to grow and to progress and to uh, develop, there's another group that wants what? Wants co complete domination. It wants to overpower everything, it wants to rule, and it, wants to take every, it wants everything to be done the way they want it to be done. It's a classic story. But their world gets destroyed. And a group of them land on Earth. And then as they're on Earth, on this strange land, they're trying to figure out how do we function on this organic planet? How do we live in a place that's completely foreign to us? But then they begin to uh, look and see ways that they can actually fit in. By what? Transforming into machines. And even though along the way they, they, they develop relationships that help them in their plight to assimilate to a new lifestyle, the same evil entities that lie within their planet also end up on Earth. And they still have the same attitude on Earth as they did on their, their particular planet. So now we have this leader, Optimus Prime, who's trying to fight against this group, the Decepticons, this group that wants to destroy and, and take over everything, led by Megatron, and this ongoing battle ensues on Earth. The problem is that we have these organic beings who can't maintain the fight. They try. If you've seen the movies, they, they get their guns and you see they really have very little effect. They have to go on the, using bombs and RPGs and these kind of things to even try to feel equal in the battle. But yet, the Autobots, as they term themselves, begin to take a protectorate 
uh, obligation over the people who have invited them in to their planet and to their world and allowing them to live. Okay, that's the premise. Right? And the, and the Decepticons, they always get their little allies. And by, by definition, you know, Decepticons, they're deceivers. So as you watch this series, as you watch the cartoons, you start seeing how they start deceiving other human beings into doing what they want done. They deceive each other. You know, they always, you know, another one wants power over the other because he thinks he's a better leader or he's getting tired of being talked down to. And he'll, so he wants to take out Megatron so that he can, you know, take over. We're talking about the man's uh, star screen. Right? This is what he wants to do because he's tired. He feels like I should be in control. So he loves it when those episodes when Megatron is deactivated or beaten up or can't function. Right? Optimus Prime is just the leader. He's from the Prime family. He's our main man. He's, our, he's the one that without him we can't function. And all the Autobots are all willing to submit themselves completely to to Optimus Prime. And they give themselves up willingly to protect their leader. Now, there's a, quite a few things that we're going to talk about when it comes to dealing with this issue. And especially in light of the verses that the brother, you know, very nicely recited. Because when you take the time to really look at what's happening, Transformation is something that we're all going through. Even our, our, our scholars, you know, the shayuch, the students, those who are not students, everybody is transforming. The question is, how are you transforming? And what is it you're transforming into? That's a big question. Many of us never ask ourselves, even take time to look at what are we becoming? Right? You never take time to look at these things. Even like, you know, most guys, you know, because of the movies and you know, the things you see, these MMA fighters and all these guys come up, bodies are nice and tight. So you start looking in the mirror trying to figure out where you're at. Right? Where am I? Do I need to get to the gym? And then if I do, what do I need to work on? You're getting P90, P90X, tap out videos, 10 minute abs, trying to work it out. Get your little Pilates ball that you hide in the closet because you don't want anybody knowing you're doing Pilates. You say, I'm going to start running or I'm going to start playing football a little bit more because you want to get in shape. That's the kind of transformation we start looking at. Sisters, same thing. Start looking at the face, adding a little makeup here, there, trying some new colors. I think I'm going MAC this year. You know, forget Maybelline. Change up the makeup. Ooh, my skin looks so much smoother. Right? We're transforming. We're transforming. We're changing. You know, we live in an age now where people are starting to watch what they eat, how they eat, the number of times they eat per day. We're starting to count calories. We're starting to look at walking and riding bikes more than ever. We're looking at changing, transforming. Especially as you get older, you start thinking more and more about your health. And every time you get sick, you think, this might be it. We're all transforming. But a question that we have to also ask is, how are we transforming spiritually? I mean, you, you all are in university. So the assumption is, is that you're transforming intellectually. Regardless of your major, you're learning new perspectives. You're gaining uh, new insights on the, on the particular sciences for which you're studying. 
So whatever perceptions you may have had prior to your studies are being changed. And if you did do a little bit of research or you already engaged in the area of your study right now, you know, you're learning how to, you're learning, you're adding to it, you're subtracting from it, you're growing with it. Intellectually, you are transforming. If you are working out, if you are doing a little something per day, I mean, really, even just walking to class from wherever it is you live, building to building, that's exercise. So you're transforming physically. But the part that gets left out is the spiritual transformation. And many of us are very dead on the inside. We give in to our desires and our wants and we allow them to decide and rule how we function. Because there is no connection within the heart. The mind does as it wills because the desires take over. And so now we become beings of desire. That's what we are, beings of desire, of impulse. This is what we've transformed into. And because we become beings of desires, of impulse, we allow the Decepticons of, of, our, of our desires to take over the world, the planet of our being. And it deceives us. Small ways, large ways. You're on your diet, you're being strong, you think you're disciplined, but you know you want some chocolate. You know you don't need that chocolate, it's after 12. I don't, I don't need after 12. But there's that little piece of Godiva. Or what's it in Birmingham, Cantleberry, Cadbury's? <laughs> so you want some, or some chocolate cake. You say, just one day, tomorrow I'm going to go run. You eat and you don't run. Gotcha. And then you, get, then you start slacking. That's the beginning. You start slacking more. You start slacking more. You start slacking more. And then before you know it, your gut's hanging out. And you're saying to yourself, well, I'll just wait till Ramadan. <laughs> but then even that messes you up. Why? Because when, you, when, when the desires start taking over, you, as I said earlier, your level of spirituality starts to digress. Because when you look at Ramadan, this is a time of worship. If we truly believe in the words of our beloved Prophet wasallam, when he said to us, that all actions are by intention, then we know that if we go into Ramadan thinking that, you know, I'm just going to lose the weight because I'm not eating, then you know that your Ramadan is only weight loss. Because you didn't come into it with the intention of worshiping your Lord. You went into it with the intention of losing weight. And some of us don't even lose weight. Because you eat so much at night. You're trying to pack it in because you think during the day it's just going to digest and I'll burn it off and that's it. And then most of you are sleeping. So there's no worship, there's no weight loss, you just wasted time. You just went through the motions. And some of us don't even go through the motions. We treat it like it's an option. You'll sit and talk, whew, running heavy. Oh, oh, so the days are so long, man, I'm so hungry. Oh. And everybody else, yeah, that's right, it is. As soon as they leave, you reach under the pillow in the room. Reach and open the drawer, pull out the sandwich. Because there's no reality to your situation. Because you've given in to the desires. Because you've given in and you've let the deceivers deceive you. Because the, 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 the desires of the self are there to deceive you into believing you really need what you don't really need. And because there is no transformation of the soul to become stronger, there's no nurturing. You're not feeding it. You're not watering it. You're not giving it any kind of attention. And because of that, it shrivels up. 
If you could pull your soul out and your desires out of your person, desires would be this big, fat, obese thing, and your soul would be this little shriveled up, skeletal looking creature. That just looking at you might just find, you wouldn't even find pity for it. You'd be afraid of it. Be some golem looking creature. But that's because you haven't given it what it needs. You haven't concerned yourself with its transformation. And this becomes very important when you allow these desires to take you, take over you. And I'm really talking to you about this because as college, as university students, you're exposed to a lot of different things. And you're at a point in life where you're not under your parents' wing anymore. You're free. Especially those of you who've come from very far, like many, I see a lot of Malaysian students, Indonesian students perhaps. How far is your parents, I mean, that's what, 13, 12 hour flight? They have no control, none. They can say what they want to on the phone, but you get to hang up. And then you'll say whatever you're gonna say and do what you want to do. For you students who came from uh, other cities throughout this country, your parents are back there. You do what you want to do. I remember my first night in university. I'm hanging out, this is before Islam, I'm hanging out in the club, and I'm like, man, what time is it? It's 11 o'clock. Ah, oh, man, my mom's going to kill me. Hey, wait. <laughs> there is no mom. Yeah. <laughs> Stayed out till the sun came up, three days in a row. You're exposed to different things. Life is much more open for you. And this is the point where desires hit you the most. This is the point where it really comes at you. Because you're trying, many of you are trying to figure out who you are, where you belong, where's your niche. Not only just within your, your respective area of study, but in society. Where do you belong? Who are you? Are you an activist? Are you a pacifist? Some of you will come to the point where you're going to start asking yourself, am I even really Muslim? Do I really believe? Because as we read in the ayats about the hypocrites, they were ones who what? Believed and then turned away from belief. <coughs> you just flip back a couple of slides and you'll see it yourself. He said, Allah says that the hypocrites are those who believed and then fell into what? Disbelief. Because these are the people that allow themselves to transform into something different based upon their desires. There's a reason why Allah said, do not allow your wealth and your children to what deceive you. Because you think you've made it just because you've got big money? You think you've arrived because you've got some status in your, in your, within your workplace or amongst your peers? You really think that you're somebody? until you get sick and you die. And as Allah mentions in the, in the ayahs that were read, that pay attention and start doing right now. Because the things that you receive are actually gifts. You don't do anything. You've done nothing. What you have, you have because Allah gave it to you. If you're a very intelligent person, you're the top of the class, it's not because you, you, it's just you. You didn't make yourself brilliant. You weren't in the, in, the, in, the, in the gym working, doing brain exercises, making yourself smarter. Whatever you were able to retain, whatever you're able to understand, whatever you're able to comprehend, whatever you're able to work out, if you're great at solving problems, it's not because it's you. It's because Allah gave it to you. And it is a gift. It's a gift that has to be used properly as you transform as you as you develop 
You have to give thanks for the gifts that you have received because Allah also says that we give to those whom we will and we also take away from whom we will. So the saying gifts that you have been given can also be taken away. I knew a guy when I was in university, handsome man, had a beautiful, beautiful fiance, used to dress nice. Everybody was like, man, look at this guy, man. Look good. And he was a very intelligent guy. Then he had a car accident. Face went straight through the windshield, or you say a windscreen saver. He was in a wheelchair. One eye is looking this way and the other eye is looking that way. Lost his fiance because the accident was his fault, lost a lot of money. I mean, he still dressed nice. But I mean, you know, you're in the wheelchair. You can't be t too cool in the wheelchair. Life changed. Life changed just like that. So when you get these things, when you achieve certain things, don't start, don't, don't take the arrogant route. Don't start beginning to think that you're, you've arrived and that you've achieved all this on your own merits because I put in the hours. You only put it in because the law allowed you to. Remember who we are. We are the creation of Allah. We exist because he allowed us to exist. We don't exist because we willed ourselves into existence. We don't exist because we decided one day out of nowhere that I, you know, I need to be. We're here because we've been allowed to be here. And the things that we have, we have because Allah has given it to us. Don't concern yourself with what you don't have. Look at what you do have. And be happy and look at what you have and be able to flourish with, with what you have. But remember that w as people to reach perfection, we have to strive not only to develop ourselves uh, intellectually, physically, but also spiritually. We have to take care of the mind, the body and the soul. These are very important. And again, specifically for you, brothers and sisters, because you're at a point, as I mentioned earlier, that the desires are there. The desires are there to do so much. To do so much. To get into so much. And then as you're going through this journey of transformation, in order to make your transformation a smoother path, you got to start looking at the people that are around you. Because you have people who are standing there smiling in your face, but talking about you behind your back. They sound like they want to be close to you and like they're looking for, for you to do the best that you can, but they're really plotting and hoping that you fail. You may be innocent, you're not even thinking about certain things, and you find out a couple of, you know, from the brother's standpoint, you find out a couple of sisters may like you. That's not your concern. But the, your, your mate likes one of those sisters that likes you. Now he's upset with you because she likes you, but you have no clue about all of this. And all of a sudden, when you're talking to him, he's all short worded. Hey, how you doing? Fine. What's going on? Nothing. What's wrong? Die, don't worry about it. Or he might be like, yeah, man, I'm doing okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what are you doing today? Uh, I thought I might go and you know, do a little more study. No, 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 no. Why don't we just go out and go hang out a little bit? Because he's trying to get you away from your work. He's trying to pull you away from the drive that attracted you or, to this, or this woman to you. Sisters do the same thing. Better find out, you know, there was a sister in our community who was in love with this one guy. And she was making it known all over Facebook. <laughs> but the brother doesn't use Facebook, so he had no clue about all of this. And so when he went and married this other woman, she went, oh, it was a, it was a, it was a hell storm. 
all on Facebook. How could she? She was my friend. How could she do this to me? Oh, she's a backstabber. She's this, she's that, she's this. And then she tried to put her friend's personal business out in the open for her guy she married to find out about hoping he would divorce her and then marry her. What kind of mess is that? You know, you could just, you know, not be a sore loser. Just say, oh, well, alhamdulillah. Allah make it good for you, you know, and just bow out and just, you know, look for somebody else. A, a ton of men. But no, she wanted to spread the news, spread all this bad information about this other person. Why? Because her desires overtook her. You know, when we hear these stories of Sahaba, when the, the people from Mecca came into Medina and all these men who were unmarried and you know, didn't know how they were going to handle themselves, being in Medina, lonely, away from family and everything else. Well, these other men who had more than one wife said, look, you know, they're divorcing the wife so that these guys can marry these women. So that these guys who are our brothers could have a wife and be happy and, you know, and maintain themselves within their religion and within their way of life. Now, that's some deep brotherhood. That's some deep brotherhood. And it's also deep for the woman. To be willing to say, look, you know, you're going to let me go. I'll marry one of these men. Now, I love you, but I need to be with one of them because they're new. They need the help. That's a deep situation. When you sit and think about it. From both sides. And then to be the recipient of that is kind of like. Ugh. It takes a man, another man to be a real man, to know that this man who was just married to this woman just. Divorce her so I can marry her. Now, I'm marrying a woman who's just been with another man that I happen to know now. That takes a special kind of man to deal with those kind of things. It takes a special woman to be willing to do these kind of things. So now, here it is. We're stabbing each other in the back over one man. Or brothers stabbing each other in the back over some woman. And I use this relationship situation, but it's not just there. It's in the workplace. There's competition in study. I remember when I was studying, I remember my political science class, I got, a, I got a D on the exam. And one of the guys who used to be in there laughed at me. And I don't like being laughed at. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. The competition has just begun. Oh, I'm going to get this guy. But what I did was I saw that the, the, the guy was very studious. So I genuinely went to him and said, hey, do you mind if we study together? He was like, yeah, he kind of gave me his little rules and conditions for studying. OK, no problem. We met in the library. We studied together, studied hard, actually had you know, a little conversation here and there. But afterwards, when we got to uh, our, our next exam, when the, when the results were passed back out, I got the A, he got the B. And he was furious. And I remember the teacher saying, well, uh, question number 32, uh, we're going to scratch that out because uh, it really was, shouldn't have been on the exam. So everybody gets one point. So I said, hmm, one point. So my mate here got an A2 as a result of that one point. So I said, uh, excuse me, professor, um, I already had an A. So what is this one point going to do for me? Well, Mr. Heiso, you'll just get an A plus. I said, oh. <laughs> and I looked at my, my maid and said, you've never had one of those before, have you? <laughs> <laughs> he was furious. In fact, so much so he didn't want to study with me anymore. <laughs> it's like I'm helping, this, the, I'm helping the enemy. You know what I mean? It, it was time that, that type of attitude because the competition became, was on. Oh, it was on for the rest of the year. But my, from my perspective, and again, it's not I'm putting myself on the pedestal nor putting him down. What I'm saying is, is that I didn't really want to see him fail because me, he gave me drive. He gave me a purpose. He gave me something to strive for. And I loved him for that. 
He didn't like it because I was on, the, on his heels and I think he felt he was better than me. Allah knows best. But the point is, is that there are people who always have this type of attitude. Why should this person have this when I'm better than them? How did they get that when I should have had this? So now, when we look at this aspect of transformation, you even have to ask yourself again, what am I transforming into? What am I becoming? Am I becoming that person that's spiteful? Am I becoming that person that's jealous because other people are getting things that I'm not? That everybody else is being pushed before me? I'm the one getting left behind? Am I the person that's going to deceive other people, to try and get other people to hate other people so that I can, get, I can receive the praise? Well, this is my friend. I don't want you to be in friends with this person. Or that's my enemy, so you can't talk to that person because if you talk to that person now, you're my enemy too. Am I becoming that person? Because that's not Islam. That's not how I'm Muslim. That's not the, the akhlaq, the mannerism, the, the characteristics of a real Muslim. So we have to ask ourselves, where are we and what are we becoming? Where are we going in our lives? And are we allying ourselves with those people that are going to help us to get to where we need to be? Are we moving in that direction? And sometimes you have to cut people off because they're not helping you. When um, there used to be a show in the, in the United States called G's to Gents. It's an old show. I don't know if any of you probably, some of you do, you're nodding yes. Okay, you know it. Mashallah. It's a reality show where they take these thug type guys and they teach them how to be gentlemen. Right? Little competition, guys get kicked off. Well, this one uh, rap, old school rapper, producer, Master P, he came on the show and he said, guys, you got to look at the people around you as assets and liabilities. He said, because if they're not helping you to arrive to the points that you want to be at, they're liabilities and you got to cut them off. Because the liabilities, all he's going to be there for is for you to pay for him to get into the club, for you to buy all the drinks, for you to get all the food, for, you, for them to hang around, pick up the girls that you leave behind. All they're doing is just sucking up things off of you. They're like leeches. So they're not adding to you, they're subtracting from you. And because of that, you've got to cut them off. And to me, I was like, I was listening and I was like, wow. That's what made me watch the show more. I just had to be flipping the channel and I saw it and I was like, okay. And then I heard him talking. I was like, oh, Master P. So I was looking at it and then he, he made this statement. I was like, man, I need to watch this program further because I want to see what happens. But it's so true. It is so true. Just in life in general. People are either going to help you or they're going to hurt you. Some people are going to help you. You know, we have certain people around for different reasons. This person makes me laugh. This person's funny. Uh, this person's smart. This person actually is spiritual and can give good advice. This person is kind of deep. And this other person, well, they're just here. Different aspects. Everybody has a reason for having somebody around. So now the question comes for you is, which friend are you? Are you the one that's just around? Are you just the funny one? Or are you the one that offers deep insights to problems that you're, you're, the people around you might have? Question is, why would someone want to be your friend? Why would somebody want to be around you? Are you a Decepticon or are you an Autobot? Are you deceiving this person and believing something that they're not? I mean, if my collar were all messed up, I would expect this brother over here to tell me my collar's messed up. If I had something hanging out of my nose, he better tell me. 
If he doesn't, he's not a real friend. So what are you doing in my life? You got me walking around here looking terrible. Didn't say a word. I've been talking to you for the past 15 minutes and you didn't say one thing. Oh, I didn't even notice it. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. You knew good and well what was going on, but you wanted me to stay that way because you wanted people to see it. You wanted me to be humiliated. A real friend would tell you, look, man, something in your nose, fix your hair, fix your collar. Look, you know those pants, do not go with that shirt. <laughs> Sister, no, that's the wrong hijab. No, girl. <laughs> those shoes do not go with that outfit. And you know that. Nothing wrong, that's how it is. Sister, you've got something hanging out your nose. Sister, <laughs> fix yourself up. That's what a real friend does. A real friend doesn't tell you what you want to hear. A friend tells you as it is. So what are you? Where do you lie in this? What are you becoming? Where are you going in your life? What do you stand for? What are your values? What are your principles? These are things you have to ask yourself. Because you're going to go into the workplace. And you have to be solid. Uh, Sheikh Uthman Damfodio in, uh, in what was called Bilad de Sudan, northern Africa. He used to take the men into the mountains before he would have to defend his lands from other outsiding intruding forces. He would take the men into the mountains and just train them spiritually. Because he needed for them to understand the importance of having a law in their life and who it was they were actually going to be defending their lands for. It wasn't for their own homes or their own wives and kids. It was for the sake of Allah. So he wanted to develop the men spiritually so that their basis was intact. So that when they went to defend their lands, they were like hard-boiled eggs, meaning Kind of hard on the outside, but, very, but filled with sustenance, with substance on the inside. As opposed to a regular egg that he, when you hit it, it just cracks open and everything just falls out. A hard-boiled egg stands strong. You may drop it, but nothing's falling out. You've got to do more with it. You've got to struggle with it a little bit more to get to the meat. He wanted hard-boiled eggs. He wanted men filled with substance. But what substance? The type of substance that allows them to stand up in the middle of the night without anybody waking them up, turning their face to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while everyone else is asleep. The type of substance that allows them to get up before Fajr and start reading Quran. The type of sustenance that allows them to treat their women and their neighbors properly and their children with the best of manners. All for the sake of Allah. So again, the question now becomes, what are we filled with? Are we men and women of substance? And like the egg, the egg has to transform. It didn't just become hard-boiled. It took some time. It took temperature. It took a whole chemical reaction to cause a particular uh, 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 chemical balance to change. And the makeup and the substance of that, the, su the sustenance or the substance of that egg, of that yolk, had to ref... Uh, oh, messing up my words. But it took a while for that egg to basically congeal and become strong and hardened. In other words, the journey is not easy and it takes time. But there is an end result. And the question is, what do you want your end result to become? What are you going to transform into? We can't turn into motorcycles and cars. We can't change shape into some plane and just fly away when the going gets tough. We just, just go. 
We're not like manimal. We can't turn into birds and tigers and stuff like that and just head out. We're not like, uh, we're not like mystique where you can just change your face when you want. You can just totally be somebody else and live a whole nother life. You are you. And you have to deal with you and the reality of you on a daily basis. We learn to adapt. But we learn to adapt with a base. And that base should be our love for Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And even understanding what that love really means. Which means that we have to take time to explore what does it mean for me when I say that I love Allah? What is that love? How are you defining that love? How are you living? How are you expressing that love? And have you allowed that love to transform you? Can you let go of those desires? Can you beat that beast down and start taking control of it instead of allowing it to take control of you? When does the revolution of self begin? When do you start taking back the planet of you from the deceptions of the, desi of the desires? When do you struggle and fight and remove these things so that you can discover what's actually even in your heart? And to be able to take that and understand how to focus on your own soul and build and nurture and develop it. What do you do? Are you going to be that person that is like in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he says that a, a friend can be either like that of the perfume dealer or the blacksmith? Are you going to be that person that when people are around you, when they leave, they leave with something great? That your persona, your presence leaves a mark upon them so that when they walk away from you, they're still basking, maybe even still smiling, reflecting on the time they just had and spent with you. Or are you going to be like the blacksmith that leaves the stains? That when the people walk away from you, they're worse than they were when they first, before they saw you. What effect do you have over the lives and the people that are around you, is the question. What effect do you have? And this is important, very important, because one day, inshallah, everyone in this room that doesn't will have children. And that will be the day, as they're growing, you're going to look in the face of your child and you're going to think back, inshallah ta'ala, on this particular talk. And you're going to say, that brother was talking about transformation. Now I'm watching my own child transform. I'm watching my own child transform. I used to ask my son, I have a 17-year-old son. And I asked him when he was like 11, 12, I said, son, what kind of girls do you like? Look, I don't want to talk about that. I'm not getting married. It's just going to be me in my apartment with my pets. That's it. You know, my son loves to play football. He's like, I'm playing football. That's it. I'm not doing anything else. So, okay. My son, his mother, and uh, their family, they moved to Kuwait for about uh, three years. He comes back. I've been gone for a while. I come back to the United States. He's 17 now. So I'm with him. We're driving. I say, son, what kind of woman do you like? 
well, you know, I like them kind of tall, kind of this way. <laughs> you know, I like a woman has an engaging conversation, a woman that's exciting, like stimulates my mind. And, I, and literally, I was driving, I was like, <laughs> my son has changed. My son has transformed. Now I have to watch him. I'm looking at him. I'm watching his movements. I'm watching how he, how he walks and how he talks and how he is around me in the house and how he is outside when he's with his mates. I got to figure him out without asking too many questions because I got to see where, what my son is transforming into. And then I have to look at myself and say, what, what, have I, what am I? Not what am I transforming into? Where am I at right now? Because he's seeing me right now. He's seen my transformations. He's watching me right now. Now I've got to figure out how I can help him through his transformations. And then I have a three-year-old and I'm looking at her face and I'm seeing all this potential. All these things that she can be. All these things that she could be. I also look at the things that she could be doing that would bring tears to my eyes. I recognize the, the, the diseases of the heart. I recognize the, the fallacies of man. I recognize the weaknesses of man. And the things and the troubles and the, and the pressures that people and children are growing up with in today's time. And it doesn't matter what country because it's pretty much baseline all the same. So I'm thinking to myself, I really have to see and help in their transformation. But if I'm spiritually shot, if I'm spiritually empty, if I lack the intellectual capacity or even the physical capacity to assist them, then what have I done with my life? What have I done with my life? And inshallah, the issue of children is a long way away from you for you guys. But it is going to be a reality, inshallah, one day. So much to think about, isn't it? So much to do. But Allah says that he does not place a burden upon a person that they cannot, that they don't have the capacity to achieve. So even though it seems difficult, it seems like a lot, you can do it. And the road is not easy. Allah says in Surah Al-Qabut that can, do you say you, you believe and think that you will go untested in that for which you say you believe in? Remember the hypocrites were people that believed. But when the going got tough, they got going. Are you going to turn and run? Are you just going to give up the revolution of self? And allow your desires just to take you off to whatever? To always be in a drunken state? A state of lack of understanding and cohesion? You're not cognizant of the world around you? Or do you want to be a person that's in complete control of their faculties? There's power and self-control and being able to make your decisions before you no longer have the ability to make your decisions. May Allah allow you guys, all of you, to be people who are firm, people of conviction, people of substance, people that are transforming into something wonderful, but based upon your own journey and levels of discovery of yourselves and where you are on this planet where you where are you in humanity and within this ummah and more importantly where are you with Allah may you be people who follow the straight path may Allah bless you guys with success inwardly as well as outwardly may he give you the things that you need and a few of the things that you want and may what you want be what you need. 
We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you all with a beautiful path and journey. And I pray that Allah blesses all of us to meet again, if not in this life, in Firdos. Ya Rahman Rahimin, Ya Rahman Rahimin, Ya Rahman Rahimin, Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you again for having me. Thank you again for listening so attentively. And inshallah, please keep us in your dua. Assalamu alaikum.